Well, hello, everybody. My name is Kevin Roth, and I'm with Alpha Data. I'm a principal engineer, so I do design work. And I'm here today to talk to you about how to get COTS hardware into space and how NASA, AMD, TI, and Space VPX are helping enable the industry to do this. So the agenda today, we will start with AMD and their radiation tolerant parts that they've been coming out with lately. And then I'll talk about how TI is helping power all this innovation. And then uh, NASA and how they're helping constrain the Space VPX specification uh, to make it a little easier for hardware vendors like us to pick parts. And I'll finish that off with an example of a Alpha Data board, of course. All right, so AMD has a nice, good, long heritage in space. Uh, about 20 years ago, they had their first radiation tolerant part, which was a Vertex 4 family. That was on the 90 nanometer process node, so going back to when things were a little bit bigger. Uh, they had a Vertex 5 piece as well, which was radiation hardened, so at a little bit higher level. And then there was a bit of a gap um, in their space profile. So more recently, so about 2020, so just a few years ago, they came out with a radiation tolerant Kintex ultrascale part. And this was pretty revolutionary in the industry because it gave a whole new level of performance uh, for what you could do in space applications. There were 32 transceivers capable of 12 and a half gigabits per second, uh, DDR4 memory controllers to help buffer all that information around, and a really huge DSP and FPGA logic resource capability. So Xilinx AMD built on this success with the next generation of devices that they had, which is the Versal series. So this saw further power reduction by dropping all the way down to a seven nanometer process node. It also has a really powerful system on chip architecture, which has been touched on in some previous presentations, uh, including AI engines, um, which is a really powerful technology to have right on the edge there. The transceivers took a step up as well. So there's 44 of them, quite a few, all running at 26 gigabits per second each. So you can do the fastest networking speeds possible. And then two and a half times more logic resources than the KU60 as well. So it, once again, is pushing all the limits in space. So for you who are not familiar with the system on-chip architecture, uh, here's a diagram, also shockingly familiar to the previous presentation. <laughs> Uh, what these devices have inside them are application processors, something similar to like an x86, some real-time processors, platform management controllers, uh, the adaptable engines, which is what they call the sort of more generic FPGA resources that are still inside of them, and these new adaptable intelligent or AI engines. Uh, there's also some hardened DDR4 controllers, PCI Express, and MR Max to help with networking. And what they do to make this all work is have a really massive network on chip, or a NOC. And that's where the bandwidth advantages really come from. So you can tie all these features together and do it extremely quickly and achieve massive performance increases. So you have all these new features and you're squeezing them into such a small space, of course you're gonna have some power issues. And while Vita provides lots of good ways to get the power out of a system, they don't describe too well how to get it back into the system. So Versal has a scalable compute capability, which is about 100 watts. Uh, this Versal AI core chip that is radiation tolerant is the VC1902. Uh, it has a range of probably about 20 watts on the very low side, so it's hardly doing anything, all the way up to 150 watts running flat out. So your board power could reach about 200 watts, which is about the limit of what you can do in some of these VPX profiles. So how do you achieve getting all that power into such a small space with, uh, so 200 watts with 12 volts, maybe five volts um, for the open VPX and space VPX spec um, into a radiation tolerant environment? So TI is helping power this innovation with their space enhanced plastic parts, or SEPs. These give you smaller footprints, uh, reduced weight, and lower cost than traditional ceramic packages. Uh, they give you about 30 to 50 K rad or 43 mega electron volts of radiation tolerance, uh, which is not radiation hardened, but it's good enough for most applications. Uh, they offer, also offer traceability and enhanced reliability over commercial variants, which are um, really essential for space launch applications. They also give us smaller package and more familiar um, package options, which COTS board vendors like us are more familiar with, including QFNs, SOICs, and monolithic DC-DC converters. 
It really speeds the design process along. You can even achieve the very low core voltages of about 0.8 volts at the extremely high current ratings, say 160 amps, um, that these versatile ACAP devices require. And what's even better, they are footprint compatible with full radiation hardened parts if you have the money to spend on it. All right, so these are some parts of note that we've used in our designs. And while the part numbers won't mean much to you, uh, it is kind of useful just to look at the column that says the input voltages that are available. And you'll see 12 volts and 5 volts work well for many of these supplies. The V outs are also low enough to achieve a lot of the different rails, the design voltages for the ACAP chips. And there's quite a range of output currents, so you can uh, scale all the power supplies appropriately and save some cost and space. The um, footprint compatibility is a big deal here, too. I mentioned that earlier. And this slide really uh, shows that well. So on the far left, you can see there are uh, the radiation tolerance plastics. So that's the SEP family. And then on the very far right, there are the radiation hardened hermetic, like uh, ceramic packages, those gold ones that you see on a lot of space flight applications. Uh, and what they've done here is they've actually created a new band in the middle, which uses the same plastic parts the space-enhanced plastic ones, but they actually put them to the same radiation levels, use the same qualification testing, but they're in a much more common plastic packaging. And these are full rad hard parts that can be upgraded on the hardware. All right, so now we have some of the world's most advanced processors and a way to power them all up. But now we've got to put them all in a system to communicate with other devices. And of course, this is where Vita comes in with all of their standards and helps us create interoperable hardware. So we're talking about Space VPX here, which is Vita 78, and it tailors uh, Open VPX, which is Vita 46, for space applications. Luckily, Space VPX is not as expansive as Open VPX, uh, but it is still pretty unmanageable from a board vendor perspective when you're trying to design COTS hardware. How do you pick a profile and all these communication interfaces? <laughs> And to illustrate this point, I've chosen to look at the 6U VPX permutations available. I counted well over 10,000, for instance. So how do you pick one? On the electrical standpoint, there's three different power distribution arch architectures proposed by Space VPX, three different data planes supported, and at least three expansion planes. You'll see the middle option there says user defined. So that's a whole can of worms, right? Uh, control planes, you have three options, and those are different phi's, so they are not interoperable at all. And all these nice little white squares that you see scattered throughout are, of course, user-defined GPIO. Those can be anywhere from 1.8 volts to 5 volts single-ended, differential, high speed, low speed, uh, 1,000 base T, all sorts of things that do not communicate when plugged into each other. Some of them are even destructive, and you could destroy your extremely expensive hardware if you plug them in wrong. And that's not what we want at all. Uh, there's also quite a few options on the mechanical front. Space VPX actually introduced a whole bunch of new pitch profiles just to make it even more complex, uh, a few more increments of 0.2 inch. And there's also new lengths that are proposed on top of uh, the open VPX standard. So you can start getting much longer longer cards to support the larger space plastic or space packagings. And of course, you can mix 3U and 6U, which just doubles your options at the end anyway for system integration. So lots and lots of options. Very hard to design COTS hardware with this. Not only AlphaData was complaining about this, NASA realized the problem it posed for the industry as well. So last year, actually, at Embedded Tech Trends, they gave an excellent presentation about a report they had written which proposed uh, standardization and a new dot spec within the Vita standards. This would lead an effort to reduce the breadth and increase compatibility and reuse. Of course, that leads to reduced costs, uh, increased ecosystem options, and reuse between projects, and of course, interchangeability. So to illustrate this, I saw at least a factor of 200 reduction in all the different options. On uh, electrical permutations, you only get one power architecture. You only get one data plane, which is Ethernet. Uh, the expansion plane is limited to either PCI Express for like processor communications or JSD 204 for ADCs and DACs. The control plane was selected as SpaceWire, which is the most common control plane in use today, so they standardized on it. And probably most importantly, they propose um, keeping GPIO at a much more constrained 
options. So using 2.5 volts CMOS or 1600 millivolt, which is uh, for CERTAs, like high speed. You could use it for Aurora, PCI Express. It gives you lots of options, but at least it's electrically, um, electrically compatible. Uh, so you don't have to worry about damage or anything like that. Mechanical permutations weren't reduced by quite as much. They kept all the switch op, uh, profile uh, pitches, but that's not so bad, because if you design a point inch pitch card, it'll fit in all the other ones, no problem. And they also selected a single length to go on, which is the 220 uh, millimeter one. Slightly longer than standard to help fit all the parts, but not quite as extreme as some of the really big ones. And of course, they let you still mix 6U and 3U, because that's just something the industry needs. All right, so an industry example, uh, just so happens to be an alpha data card. Uh, here we have an ADM VA601. This is something that we actually designed in collaboration with uh, Xilinx, uh, AMD. So here's the slot profile. The module length is, uh, well, it's a slot profile from the Space VPX spec to start with. Uh, if you're familiar with all these pretty colorful drawings. <laughs> the module length is 220 millimeters, so it lines up with the NASA recommendations, a pitch of one inch. Uh, the P1 connections are data plane, and they are Ethernet compatible. Uh, you can use a soft Mac there. Uh, there's also hardened PCI Express endpoints if you want to stray from the NASA recommendations. Uh, P2 does have an expansion plane quad available, which can easily use PCI Express or the JESD 204. There is some GPIO on the card as well. Uh, it's actually 3.3 volts was the way that we had designed it, and that's not quite the 2.5 volts proposed by the NASA guys, but it is compatible with 2.5 volt input, so it's actually quite close. And uh, most importantly, the space wire control plane interfaces allow for compatibility within uh, one of those space VPX systems. So there are some potential optimizations that could be made. The data plane could be more aligned with some of the hardened Macs inside of the Versal ACAP device. And the GPIO could probably be reduced down to 2.5 volts pretty easily uh, if customers wanted to do something like that, just to ensure compatibility with those devices. Uh, just here's a picture of it. Uh, it is that VC1902 part. If you recognize, there's a couple Vita profiles in use here, besides 6U VPX, which I've mentioned. We also have an FMC Plus connector on there. Uh, it's fully populated, so it has all the transceiver lanes and GPIO hooked up to that Versal ACAP device, allowing customers to implement all sorts of custom solutions on top of this development kit. And this is designed as a development kit, so it has all the reference designs, uh, schematics, layouts are all available to help customers launch off onto their own uh, custom platforms as needed, but it's also designed to be fl fully flight ready if people do want to use this and launch it in the space. Uh, there is radiation tolerant uh, DDR4 and um, all sorts of other components on well as well, which you can see here we are in the um, block diagram. There is a system monitor, which is quite helpful in showing the health of the board, the DDR4 and there's a configuration flash mezzanine so people can pick their own radiation tolerant configuration devices, which is a pretty important piece of all this. And of course, just massive connectivity to the backplane and that FMC site. This just sort of illustrates the daughter card on there. So an FMC plus double width profile will fit. So you can get lots of RF connectors in there. And then there's that little mezzanine connector I mentioned on the side. It does come with an RTM, so it helps break out all those signals on the backplane when you want to just do some debug and you don't have a full system backplane ready for all the connectivity. It has a small zinc device, which you can see up there, built into it, which will help you do some scrubbing or any other sort of software emulation activities for things that you would have on your flight system that um, you want to interface with the board earlier on. All right, so next steps. Uh, as far as the industry is concerned, I would hope that we can simplify and narrow the space VPX spec a little bit, sort of like what SOSA is trying to do for open VPX with really pretty good success. From Alpha Data's perspective, we want to get that ADM VA601 board uh, flight ready, so the flight version of it, which of course will take quite a bit of reliability analysis and testing before we can get there. And then as far as future product goes, uh, small form factor we find very interesting. 
the AMD guys are coming out with the versatile AI edge part, which is for much lower power applications. So something in the four watts to 25 watt uh, range on the chip, probably a 50 watt board. And this would fit really, really nicely with uh, Space VPX Lite, so those 3U modules, or possibly even Space VNX Plus, uh, if that standard ever gets released. <laughs> All right, so that is my presentation. Do we have any questions? <laughs>